Ghosts, Spectres, and Haunted Board Games. Tonight we talk about a film that has all of the above as we plumb the depths of the Netflix library to bring you another horror movie review. It's all coming up on an all new episode of Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat. Good evening and welcome to another episode of Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat. Tonight we once again venture into the film library over on Netflix for another surprisingly good ghost story. We'll take some time to talk about that film, plus some other stuff that I watched this week, and we'll even take some time to work in an episode of Monster Chat with Professor Fluffosaurus. Now, this is normally where we would check in with our friend Crimson Meerkat, who has been on an extended road trip. But he's been tied up with budget meetings all day as we try to come up with a way to get him home from deep down in the hollow earth. So instead, we're going to just get right to it. Thank you so much for joining us. We're glad to have you along. Now sit back and grab your popcorn because here we go. Hello and welcome to Monster Chat, I am your host Professor Edgar Fluffosaurus. Tonight we discuss one of the more famous residents of the Hollow Earth, the Tyrannosaurus Rex. Of all the dinosaurs that can be found in the Hollow Earth, perhaps the most recognizable is the Tyrannosaurus Rex. Tall and stately, with a prominent chin and sophisticated disposition, the Tyrannosaurus Rex is the epitome of elegance. However, Despite its noble appearance, the Tyrannosaurus rex always found it difficult to gain access to the inner circle of dinosaur culture because of two impediments, namely, its two tiny forearms. Tyrannosaurus rex was never able to overcome the stigma of its two tiny arms or the many shortcomings that they entailed. Although tall and stately, the Tyrannosaurus rex was rarely invited to sophisticated dinner parties because its small arms made it impossible to put on a tie. Unable to penetrate the upper strata of high society, the Tyrannosaurus rex remained a social outcast and was openly mocked by other dinosaurs such as the Allosaurus and Pterodactyl. Ashamed of its social status, it was not unusual for the Tyrannosaurus rex to become members of the counterculture such as beat poets and performance artists. However this too had its limits, as Tyrannosaurus rex's short arms made it impossible to play instruments such as drums or jazz flute. The fact that there are no great Tyrannosaurus blues musicians is testament to its inability to play the harmonica. But this is only the beginning of the list of career fields that eluded Tyrannosaurus rex. For example, its combination of a large head and small arms made it impossible to properly position a computer monitor and keyboard. Tyrannosaurus was thus shut out of career fields such as accounting or software development. Similarly, the odd proportions of the Tyrannosaurus made it unsuitable for jobs such as pastry chef or short order cook, as its lips would get burned on the cooktop every time Tyrannosaurus stretched to flip a hamburger. As a result of this, Tyrannosaurus rex is well known for its sour attitude and propensity to eat anyone it encountered. Should you ever encounter a Tyrannosaurus rex, my advice is to run away. It is unlikely that you will be able to outrun the Tyrannosaurus, but at least you will be secure in the knowledge that you made the effort. This has been Monster Chat, hosted by Professor Edgar Fluffosaurus. Thank you for joining me. Really, the only thing that I can say about my mother is that she wanted to know that we weren't alone after my dad died. My mom just got that. She and her bridge club friends play it sometimes. Is that the one where you talk to ghosts? 
Roger. Honey, are you there? I don't think your daughter is a fraud. I believe she is channeling powers and forces we do not understand. It's actually really scary. You guys want to play? She's part of the walls now. Do you know what it feels like to be strangled to death? Come with me. I can help you. Yea, though I walk through the valley in the shadow of death, I shall fear no one. He's gone. He lives in the dark and the cold. Death. And she told me the most wonderful, awful things. All right, let's get into our featured film review for the evening. Tonight, we're going to talk about this film. It is called Ouija, Origin of Evil. This is a supernatural horror film, which you might have gathered from the poster. It was released in the year 2018, so relatively recent. And good news, directed by Mike Flanagan, a very good horror director, known for having directed Midnight Mass, The Haunting of Hill House, The Haunting of Bly Manor, Dr. Sleep. He directed a film years ago called Absentia, which you probably have not seen, but is worth watching if you're into uh, something psychological. The cast includes Elizabeth Freezer, Annalise Basso, and Henry Thomas. So let's talk about Ouija Origin of Evil. If you're going to sit down and watch Ouija Origin of Evil, what you should expect is a PG-13 supernatural period piece. Beautiful period piece that takes place in the 1960s. If you like The Conjuring, you will probably like Ouija Origin of Evil. If you like Insidious, you'll probably like Ouija Origin of Evil. It's very similar to, say, a combination of those two films. Uh, the Conjuring in terms of being a period piece, Insidious in terms of being more PG-13. Let's get into calibrating your sights. If you're going to go see this film, we have a scale we like to use. On the far left side of the scale, we have very campy films, such as Jason X. On the far right side of the scale, we have very serious films, such as The Silence of the Lambs. Now, this scale is not a measure of the quality of the film. It's an indicator of what your mindset needs to be going into the film. So you don't go in expecting a comedy and go in and see a psychological drama or vice versa. You don't go in expecting a gritty drama and get something that's a comedy. Ouija Origin of Evil is a mainstream summer type release. It is more or less straight down the middle. I've put it a hair over to the right hand side just because there's not really a lot of overt comic relief in this film. But it is a mainstream uh, theatrical release from Bloomhouse. So go in with your expectations kind of right down the middle and you should be fine. Now, before we go any farther, we need to do our vocabulary lesson. This, of course, is the part of the show where we discuss new and innovative words and phrases in an effort to stay ahead of social media bots and algorithms that would otherwise try to ban our conversation. Social media bots and algorithms are always evolving, so our language must evolve to stay ahead of them. We're doing one term this week. It's a review term. Our term is peeper popping. Peeper popping is a noun referring to the action of puncturing or stabbing one or more of a character's peepers, typically with something slender and pointy, but not always. Tonight we are doing kind of a modified version of peeper popping, as we will discuss in a few minutes. Note that peeper popping is distinct from melon balling, a different vocabulary word of ours. In melon balling, the peeper is generally removed intact. Uh, peeper popping, not so much. So it's getting poked in the eye versus having the eye removed. So anyway, that is your vocabulary lesson for the evening. Please keep this term in mind. It will become important later in the episode. 
So let's get into a summary of this film. The first thing you should know is that this is a prequel to a 2014 film called Ouija. Now Ouija is your typical high school girls get into supernatural antics with a Ouija board kind of film, also done by Bloomhouse. It's not that great. It's not terrible. Uh, I do not recommend it. It's just, there's nothing to recommend it. It's just very cookie cutter. Um, Ouija Origin of Evil is a far better film. That's why I'm reviewing it. But this is a prequel to the 2014 film. In this film, Alice is a widow living with her two daughters, Lena and Doris. And Lena is short for Paulina. Alice works as a fortune teller out of her home. And in the grand tradition of fortune tellers, her daughters sometimes help her in terms of putting on a show for the clients. Yes, her act is a, is a fake. It is not real. It is just like every other ghost hunting show and Bigfoot hunting show you see on TV. Her show is not actually real. Her daughters help her put on a show for the clients. Now, at her daughter's suggestion, Alice incorporates a Ouija board into her act, thinking that, okay, here's another way that we can kind of bilk some money out of people. But they start using the Ouija board and things start happening for real and makes us wonder what has Alice accidentally set loose in her house? This brings us of course to our villain profile. Our villain for this film is Doris. And here you see Doris, nine-year-old Doris. Doris, it's kind of unfair to refer to her as the villain. Doris is more a human vessel for a demonic visitor, so she's uh, taken over by a demonic visitor and becomes the villain in that case. Her special powers are wall and ceiling crawling, and she is somewhat able to control other people's actions. And she doesn't have signature weapon, but she does have a signature technique, where Doris will whisper in your ear until she is able to capture your mind, then she makes you do her will. So Doris doesn't so much kill people on her own as whispers in the ear of somebody, takes over their mind, and gets them to do it for her. So that's your villain for the film, Doris, nine-year-old Doris. You see her here in the picture. And now a word from our benevolent overlords at PBDC-TV, your nightly heartbeat of horror. Let's get to the things I liked about this film. Right off the bat, it's a huge improvement over the 2014 film Ouija, which I do not recommend. Um, like I said, 2014 films, not terrible, but there's really nothing going for it either. It's very, very cookie cutter, very bland. Uh, it's not really worth the effort. This film is a huge improvement. It is far better. And it works as a standalone film, so you don't have to watch the 2014 film at all. You can just go in, watch Ouija Origin of Evil Cold without having any backstory, and you are perfectly fine. This film does a wonderful job of capturing the environment and atmosphere of 1967. It's a wonderful period piece. It's got all the costumes, it's got all the cars, it's got all the locations. All the board games have their old 1960s style graphics. 
it is really well done in terms of uh, capturing 1967 on screen. The film also, bonus, is very well directed and very well acted, so it's a competent picture. It looks really good on the screen. It's a beautiful period piece, uh, much like The Conjuring in that it's a beautiful period piece. The film builds tension and scares without relying on kill count or blood and gore. It is a PG-13 type film after all. And finally, the lead characters are likable. Now. There are some things that some people might take issue with in this film, right off the bat being that this is a PG-13 film, so it's tamer than many other films. If you need a lot of explicit blood and gore to keep you entertained, this is not the film for you. This film is more jump scares and supernatural antics in the second half. The kill count is low. Again, it's a PG-13 film, plus it's a supernatural kind of film. Those tend to have a lower body count anyway. The first half of the film is character building with little action, so the first half of the film, not a lot going on in terms of action, so again, if you're the kind of person who needs constant action to be entertained, this is not the film for you. If you've seen the first film, you kind of know what to expect is going to happen in this film, and that's just uh, the unfortunate thing of doing prequels. If you've seen the sequel to a prequel, you kind of know what's going to happen. Uh, you're kind of boxed into the ending of the prequel by the film that was already released. Now, even if you have not seen the 2014 film Ouija, which again, I do not recommend, the first film, uh, it is somewhat predictable. So even if you haven't seen Ouija, Ouija Origin of Evil is somewhat predictable. It is a horror movie. Horror movies do tend to be predictable by their nature. And finally, I am not sure how well this prequel meshes with 2014's Ouija. So I'm not sure these movies tie together perfectly well. Uh, maybe they do, I just need to watch and pay more attention, but that would involve watching the 2014 movie again, and I don't really want to do that. Um, I watched it not too long ago, uh, just to remind myself that, okay, it's not that impressive. Uh, Ouija Origin of Evil, very good film, but not worth going back and watching 2014's Ouija. So let's get into Steve's scorecard for this film. Kills, we have four. Bare Breasts, drum roll please, drum roll please, we have zero. Once again, it is not that kind of film. Denogginings, we also have zero, also not that kind of a film. Jump scares, there are four good jump scares in the first half of the film. I did not keep track in the second half because by the time we get to the second half, the supernatural occurrences have started and you don't really need to track the jump scares because there's other action going on. Paper popping. We do have one off-screen moment of peeper popping, and it is done with a slingshot as opposed to a slender item. Hot air ballooning, vocabulary term from our last episode, hot air ballooning, levitating about the room with no visible means of support. There's three of those. Doris is able to float around the room several times. Bungee jumps. If you want to know what bungee jumps are, you're just going to have to watch this one. I can't really describe it. There is one bungee jump in this film. Threatening palm readings. Yes, Alice gives one threatening palm reading to the boy who's interested in Lena. And finally, use of the word groovy. I thought I was going to get a big count here since it was 1967, but I only counted one. So only one use of the word groovy. Of course, that's not all you get with your viewing of Ouija Origin of Evil. You also get some bonus features, including gold digging daughter action. Yes, you'll get that in the first scene of the film. You get teen sneaking out action. And where you have teen sneaking out action, you might expect to also have boozy high school party action, and you would not be wrong. You have fake seance action. Yes, they are fake. You get foreclosure thwarting action. You get priest dating action. Uh, yes, really. You get creepy little girl exposition about strangling. Yeah, it's a little unsettling having Doris talk in grotesque detail about what it feels like to be strangled. You have wall crawling action. And where you have wall crawling action, you might also expect to find ceiling crawling action. And once again, you would not be wrong. 
Now, good piece of advice. Don't follow the creepy little girl into the basement. One of the characters in this film should have paid attention to that word of wisdom, but did not. Don't follow the creepy little girl into the basement. And finally, piece of dialogue from one character in the film, which is kind of funny. Splitting up seems like the stupidest thing in the world. Yes, we always watch horror movies and say, are they stupid? Why are they splitting up? And in this film, one of the characters actually says explicitly, splitting up seems like the stupidest thing in the world, and therefore they are not going to do it. So let's get to Steve's final score for this film. I'm going to give it three paws out of four. Now, it's more of a two and a half paw movie plus another half paw because the period piece aspect of it is done so well with the sets and the locations and the cars and the costumes and everything else. So we're going to say this is an attractive period piece that provides an interesting supernatural story told from a PG-13 perspective. So once again, if you need lots of blood and gore, this is not the film for you. It's more of a two and a half paw film, but it gains an extra half paw for the 1960s atmosphere that it thoroughly creates. So, that is our film for this week, Ouija Origin of Evil. That is our featured film review for the evening. Well, we're about at the end of another episode of Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat, but before we go, as is our tradition, we're going to take just a couple of minutes to talk about some other stuff I watched this week. This week we are talking about a film called Freaky. Freaky I found on Freebie, free with ads. It is a 2020 American horror comedy. And interestingly, this was directed by Christopher Landon, who also directed Happy Death Day, which is a very similar kind of film. Happy Death Day is kind of a uh, merger of Groundhog Day with the serial killer story. In this film, Millie Kessler is an unhappy high school student who is bullied by some of her classmates. And she is also the school mascot. And after performing as the mascot at the homecoming game, Millie waits in the empty parking lot for a ride home. Well, Millie's ride is late, but she's not by herself. While waiting, Millie is attacked by the Blissfield Butcher, a serial killer from local urban legends. Now, fortunately, Millie survives the attack, but then the next day finds that she has switched bodies with the Butcher. Yes, it's a play on Freaky Friday. The victim and the serial killer switch bodies, and it all has to do with a mystical dagger. Can she protect her friends from the butcher and find a way to get back into her own body in time? So, let's talk about Freaky. Well, this film is a mainstream release horror comedy from Bloomhouse Productions, so the production values are very good. And uh, it's got the Bloomhouse kind of feel to it, so uh, if, you know, if you're a fan, that's great. If you're not a fan, then it's not. Um, I like the film personally. I think it's a well-made and well-acted take on Freaky Friday. There are bits of graphic violence mixed in with the comedy that I do not remember from Happy Death Day. Uh, so I seems like Freaky is more graphically violent than Happy Death Day, but it's not wall-to-wall -wall graphic violence. It's just 
incidents of graphic violence spread out throughout what is otherwise a horror comedy. Now, on the pro side, the film is very entertaining and has a very likable cast. On the con side, it's somewhat predictable. I mean, serial killer stories by their nature are predictable, and this is a combination serial killer plus Freaky Friday, so it's a remake of a movie that is already existing. So, somewhat predictable. But overall, I would recommend it. If you're in the mood for a slasher comedy, something similar to Happy Death Day, you can do a lot worse. Uh, given the choice between the two, I would watch Happy Death Day before watching Freaky, but recommend either one of them. So Freaky, recommended by Steve the Cat, and that is other stuff I watched this week. Well, that wraps up another episode of Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat. Thank you so much for joining us. We're glad you're here. Now, if you did enjoy the show, then please check us out on social media. You can find Steve the Cat on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. So please stop by and hit that subscribe button. Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat is available exclusively through the PBDC Collective Incorporated, now legally incorporated, but still your heartbeat of horror. You can find us on the web at psychobunnydc.com, or you can check us out on YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, Instagram, Twitter, Rumble, and Discord. Now, the Discord site is for members only, which allows us to do some fun things. So if you're interested, please go to psychobunnydc.com and click the link for an invitation. We'll get you all set up. Next episode, we're going to talk about a film that I have wanted to review for a long time. It's sure to be a lot of fun, so make sure to join us Monday nights at 10 p.m. And remember, we're now on every other week, alternating Monday nights with Ghoul Radio. So join us next week for Ghoul Radio, and we'll be back with a new episode of Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat the following week. That's all for now, so until next time, thank you for joining us, and have a great week.